Today we're going to be looking at malware and some other threats. Let's start by looking at what's meant by malware. So the word malware is broken down into malicious software. And don't forget software, things like applications that are installed on the device itself. Now you can't see malware. Often it's installed in the background so that you don't actually know that it's there, but it's harmful and it can be really damaging to your computer or device. Often they get installed so that they can edit, delete or steal information. A way this could happen could be something like a Trojan virus, which is where you go to download something and you think it's one thing, but actually it installs malware on your computer and you don't even know that it's there. Another potential threat is unauthorized access. So unauthorized access is when someone's not been given permission to access data, but they access it anyway. There's multiple ways that this can happen. It's not just because somebody's left their laptop or device unattended. So one method could be by intercepting messages. As data is being transmitted, if it's not being encrypted, the data once it's intercepted can be read, or it could be copied, which means that they can gain access to your confidential information. Another method of unauthorized access is just by finding out someone's password, which we're going to be talking more about in a moment. As a result of unauthorized access, it could cause loss and cause damage. Now, sometimes people do this on purpose. Sometimes people accidentally cause damage once they've gained access to something by maybe moving an important file or deleting it. Now, there's different ways that people can find out someone's password. It could be through something called a brute force attack. A brute force attack is when a piece of software will try multiple combinations of passwords to try and find the correct password. A common prevention method of this is by having a strong password, which consists of a password having over 12 characters and has uppercase, lowercase characters, special characters, and numbers. Another method is by using social engineering techniques. Social engineering is where you trick someone into giving away their confidential information. A common example is something called phishing. Someone might open a malicious email, which contains a link, and when they click on that link because they've been tricked into clicking on it, it will take them to a very believable website where they might enter their details and it will go back to the attacker. Other methods might include pretext phone calls, which is sometimes referred to as blagging. And this is over the phone where you trick someone into divulging some confidential information by making up a scenario that they might believe, like they've been in an accident or their owed PPI. A final method we could talk about is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing is quite literally looking over somebody's shoulder to try and find out their password. This doesn't only have to be on a computer, it could also be at, say, a cash machine, at a checkout when people are entering their PIN, or to gain access to a locked room, like maybe a staff room at someone's workplace. The best prevention method of this is staff training and awareness. The more people talk about it, the more people know about it and what to look for, the dangers and signs, then they might not be victim to these attacks. Another thing I want to talk about today is something called user access levels. So when you join a network, you will have a different level of user access depending on who you are. So a network manager will have total access to everything so they can manage the network properly. But somebody else using the network might not have access to everything. For example, a student might not have access to program files in case they accidentally move or delete one. So there's three different levels of access that I want to talk about. The first one is called read write access. This would be someone very high up, someone like the network manager. They can view any files and they can make changes to them. Read only access is where you can view the files and read them, but you can't make any changes to them. And finally, just having no access, you're not allowed to see them, you're not allowed to do anything to them. Okay, let's look at the questions for this topic. So describe three user access levels. Give two examples of social engineering what is meant by malware and explain the process of a brute force attack. Okay, let's go through the answers. So describe three user access levels. So we've got read write access where you can view the files and make changes to them. We've got read only access where you can view the files, but you can't make changes to them. And there's no access where you can't view the files. Next one, give two examples of social engineering. So the ones that we've said were phishing, farming, pretext phone calls or blagging or shoulder surfing. Next one is what is meant by malware. So if we break it down, it's malicious software designed to edit, delete or steal data. And finally, explain the process of a brute force attack, trying every combination of words and numbers until the password is guessed. Today, we're gonna be looking at online threats. So last time we were looking at general threats, whereas these threats are specifically looking at network threats. So a common one that a lot of people have heard of and often just refer to as a DDoS is a denial of service attack or DOS or DDoS. 
When you use a network, you're sending packets of information and a DOS attack is when a large amount of packets are sent to a destination. Now the sheer volume of this amount of information being sent is what's going to overload the server or bandwidth. This in itself can just stop a computer network from working. Now the difference between a DOS and a DDoS is the extra D in DDoS stands for distributed. So a distributed denial of service is much harder to track as it comes from multiple places. One that I want to mention today but we're going to go into in more detail in the next video is something called an SQL injection. Now SQL is a type of programming which is used to edit, search and manage a database. If people use malicious SQL they might be able to gain access to the database and steal the information or change it. This is often done through a website input and the website not being very well tested for any vulnerabilities. Now we've got different ways of protecting that data. Let's have a little look at the prevention methods. So the first one, which is a really common one, is a firewall. A firewall will check all the different signals that are going in and out of a network. This will prevent any malware from entering the network. So if a packet looks suspicious, the firewall will prevent it from entering the network. Another common method is something called encryption. We've talked about encryption when we did protocols, when we were talking about HTTPS, with the S standing for secure. This is where all the data will get scrambled if it's getting sent, so that anybody who does intercept that data, it will be useless to them. Only people with an encryption key are the ones who can see that information. Different apps will use encryption called end-to-end -end encryption without you even realizing. A really common one might be on something like WhatsApp, so that when you're sending messages to other people, you can see it as plain text. As you send it, the message gets encrypted, and as it's received on the other end, that's when it becomes decrypted so that they can see it in plain text again. But anyone in between who tries to intercept that information, it'll be useless to them. Final method is penetration testing. This is where authorized people are allowed to try and break into the network and find vulnerabilities in it. And if they do find any weak points, they will report it back and they will work on fixing that area to make it more secure. As well as these, we've got physical security methods. These can be as simple as keeping computers in a locked room, or we might use something like biometrics. These are really common on smartphones where you've got things like face ID, retinal scanners, fingerprint scanners and so on. You might employ a security guard which will just stop any access unless they are authorized and you could use a swipe card like I have for work which is a little badge which will just get me in and out of the buildings. Okay let's have a look at some questions on this topic then. So explain how penetration testing is used to make a system more secure. Identify three physical security methods. What is the purpose of encryption? What is SQL injection? Okay, let's run through the answers then. So explain how penetration testing is used to make system more secure. You could have put something like, people try and break into a computer system to find weaknesses that can then be fixed. Next one, identify three physical security methods. So I went for security guard, locked rooms, swipe card entry. Next question is, what is the purpose of encryption? Data is unreadable by anyone who intercepts it. And finally, what is SQL injection? It's malicious SQL commands that are entered to steal or delete files from a database. Today we're going to look in more detail at what is meant by an SQL injection. So to start off with, let's just get a bit of an understanding of what SQL means. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. This is something that is used to edit, manage, add to, delete, search a database. Databases contain loads of really important information. This could be the information on a website, but it could also be user details. Often that's really valuable information to a hacker. So an SQL injection is a type of cyber attack where they will try and gain access to this information by using malicious SQL code. Now this will take place on websites that haven't been tested very thoroughly and it could be somewhere where the user has to type in information. This could include somewhere like a login form or a search box on a website. Now as the user is using the website like this, this is called user input. And if the website's got good web design, it will check what the user is putting in and it will clean that information before it's been inputted. So let's have a look at some methods of prevention of an SQL injection. The most common one is something called input validation. And if you think about that word validation and the word valid, when something's valid, it's, it's correct. So only if the user is putting correct information will it be allowed. This could be down to the type of information that somebody puts in. So if they were asked to enter their age, 
it might be that they're only allowed to put in an integer or even better it might come down with one of those little drop down calendars where you will choose the date that you were born and then that way there's no way the user can type in information in that box on some websites you could use something called a prepared statement so rather than the user typing in something potentially into say like a search bar you could use something called a placeholder so for example if you're on a shopping website and you're trying to find t-shirts rather than them typing in t-shirts in a search bar you would have have a little drop down menu so that you can just click on the section that says t-shirt and it will run that SQL query for you so that the search is done without the user having to type any information that, that could potentially be malicious. Linking back to the last video, you might just not want to give them any access to anywhere that they shouldn't be able to access to. So we don't want to cause unauthorized access. So you will limit their access to different areas. And finally, a great method of prevention is again, penetration testing in this case. So you will do regular checks on your system to see if there's any weaknesses, any vulnerabilities. And if there are, then you can go back and fix them. So just a couple of questions on this topic. So what is SQL injection? and explain a method of prevention for an SQL injection. Okay, let's run through the answers then. So what is SQL injection? It's malicious SQL commands are entered to steal or delete files from a database. And the other question is explain a method to prevent SQL injection. So I've gone for input validation to where we ensure all user input is checked and it only allows the expected type of data. And I've given a little example there as well. Numbers for age, no special characters for usernames. That would have been enough for the two marks, but you also could have gone for regular security testing. So you could use penetration testing to identify any vulnerabilities before the hackers do. And that's it for this one. I'll see you next time.